All right, we're gonna do two examples on page 107. For the first, we're finding the area of the region bounded by these two different curves. Um, and so we know that in general, we need to know which is the top curve and which is the bottom curve. And um, I'm gonna figure that out by, well, first thing I'm gonna do is draw a little sketch. All right, we know that this first curve is a quadratic. It's a parabola that's been translated up three units, so it has a y-intercept of three. You know, it's concave up. And then our second curve, um, I'm calling it a curve, it's really a line, I can tell that's linear. Um, that's gonna have a y-intercept of six and a slope of negative two, and I'm not super concerned about the accuracy of this sketch. I just wanna kinda have an idea of what that looks like. All right, so we are finding the area of the region bounded by those two curves. And if you're not sure what region that is, what I would recommend is look at where the two places are where those curves intersect, and then trace along one curve to one point of intersection, and then trace back on the other curve. And so what we're looking for is the region, the area of the region that's right here, that's being shaded in orange. And to think about which curve is on top and which is on bottom, let's just draw in a sample rectangle. So when we think about our rectangles that when we use a Riemann sum to integrate, here's our sample rectangle. Um, I'm gonna refer to this later on as a DX rectangle. So all the rectangles up to now have been DX. Um, we could see that the top of the rectangle is the linear piece, six minus two X, and the bottom of the rectangle is x squared plus three. So we know that the area is gonna be the integral of the top, six minus two x, minus the bottom, x squared plus three dx. But what we don't know yet are our limits of integration. So we need to know the x coordinates for the two points where these um, cross, so like our a, and our B, where the, rather where these curves intersect. So we can do that by setting them equal to each other. So out to the side, I'm gonna say X squared plus three equals six minus two X, because we know at these ordered pairs, both of these curves should give us, should have the same X and the same Y. Um, since this is a quadratic expression with a linear term, I'm gonna, sub, I'm gonna add the two X over, subtract the six. I'm gonna get everything on one side and factor going through this fast so I can get through two examples. Um, what number is multiplied to negative three? Add to positive two, that's gonna be a positive three and a negative one. And then I'm gonna use that zero product property, set each of these equal to zero, x is negative three, x is positive one. So this a value over here must be a negative three, and this b value must be a positive one. And that looks pretty reasonable. So um, from negative three to one, here's what we're integrating. All right, now the rest of this is just a review. We've done this before. So from negative three to one, I'm gonna combine my like terms in here. So I have a six minus three, that becomes a three. Boomer, stop it. Um, negative two X, there's no other linear term, so that stays negative two X. And then I have minus X squared. All right, so we wanna find that antiderivative. That's gonna become three X minus X squared minus one third X cubed. And we're gonna evaluate that from negative three to one. I know I'm going fast, but you can always pause the video. Um, we're gonna plug in the one first. Oh my goodness, my alarm keeps going off. Um, plug in the one. So I get three times one minus one squared minus one third times one cubed. And then I, I'm going to subtract um, my lower limit plugged in. So 3 times negative 3 is a negative 9. Minus negative 3 squared is minus a positive 9. And then negative 3 cubed is negative 27. A third of that's negative 9. But since it's minus negative 9, that's the same as plus 9. All right, I'm just going to cancel out two of those 9s. So 3 minus 1 is 2. I'm going to write 2 minus 1 third. Oops, and now I'm subtracting negative nine, so it's the same as plus nine. So that's gonna be 11 minus one third. 
11 is 33 thirds, so minus 1 is 32 thirds. All right, so 32 thirds is the exact, not the approximate, but the exact area of that region. All right, that's a fairly easy example. The next one's harder, so I went fast on the first one to save a little time so I could put these two on one video. All right, we're finding the area of the region bounded by f of x equals the sine of 2x and g of x equals the sine of x. Um, so we want to still graph these. Um, g of x is pretty easy to sketch a graph for. So I know that the sine of x starts at 0. Um, it's going to reach a maximum of positive 1, a minimum of negative 1. I know it goes up first. And I know what a sinusoidal curve looks like. And so um, for g of x, we learn in trig that that has a period of 2 pi. Um, we know that that curve goes on forever in that pattern, but it in like in one period of 2 pi, it reaches its maximum and minimum. So what we need to also remember from trig is that when we have a 2 there, that b value, that that period we're going to divide by 2 and that period is going to be pi. So that means that for g of x, um, it's going to between 0 and pi, it's going to do the same thing that um, g of x did, but it's going to do it in half the in half of the period. All right, that doesn't look very good. You'll just have to imagine with me. All right, so the kind of purple one, that's f of x, and the other, the black one is gonna be our g of x. All right, so um, we are told where we're going to integrate from, from zero to pi over three. Um, we know where the zero is, but the problem is we don't know exactly where pi over three is. So like if pi over three is right here, for example, um, I know f of x is on top. If pi over three is over here, we're gonna have to consider a couple different things because f of x is on top for part of it, then g of x. Um, but if pi over three is right at this intersection, that would be really convenient for us. So um, let's set these equal to each other to see if, um, in fact, pi over three occurs at one of the intersections. So um, we're gonna set sine of two x equal to the sine of x. And um, what we're gonna need here is we're gonna need to use that trig identity, the double angle formula. So um, I know that if I have sine of two x, that's really the same as two times the sine of x times the cosine of x. And if you don't remember that, it's in the back of the spiral. Um, so we're just rewriting that using the double angle formula. And then I'm gonna subtract sine of x from the right side to the left side, get that set equal to zero. And then over here, I'm gonna factor out the GCF of the sine of x. And then we're gonna use that zero product property. So when the sine of x, the first factor, when that equals zero, we know that happens on the unit circle at zero, pi, two pi, and so on. So what we get from that is this first intersection that we already knew about at zero. So we're hoping we can um, get a pi over three over here. So if two cosine of x minus one equals zero, we're gonna add the one, divide by two, so cosine of x is one half. And if I think of um, in the unit circle, where does that happen? Well, the first place that happens is at pi over three. So that does mean that this next intersection is in fact pi over three. So now we can see the specific region bound by those two curves. I'm gonna draw in my sample rectangle um, again, we are going to call these dx rectangles. We'll talk later about what a dy rectangle is. Um, so that tells me that the top curve is the f of x and the bottom curve is the g of x there. Obviously, they alternate throughout the graph, but in that part, that's what's top and that's what's bottom. 
All right, so the rest of this um, is just setting this up and then integrating. So the area from zero to pi over three is gonna be the top, which is f of x, so the sine of two x, minus the bottom g of x, the sine of x dx. And we're gonna need to do a u sub with that first part. So I'm gonna break this into two different integrals. Um, I'm gonna write from zero to pi over three, the sine of two x dx, minus from zero to pi over three, the sine of x dx. All right, we need to do a u sub for the first part. So I'm gonna let u be two x, du therefore is two dx. So for me to get a two dx, I need another two here, which means I need a one half out in front. When I do the u sub, I'm gonna change my limits of integration. So u of zero is two times zero, which is still zero. And u of pi over three is two times pi over three, which is just two pi over three. All right, so when we rewrite the first integral, it's now one half from zero to two pi over three, the sine of u du. The second one does not need a u sub. I'm just gonna rewrite it. All right, so now when we find the antiderivative, the sine of u, its antiderivative is negative cosine of u. Remember though, um, since negative one is like a constant multiplier, I could just put it out in front with the one half. So I could leave it in there or I could put it out in front. We're gonna evaluate that from zero to two pi over three because we had to change our limits of integration. And then from that, we're gonna subtract. Well, we have really the same antiderivative here, except it's an x, not a u. Um, so again, we have a, the antiderivative is negative cosine of x, but if we pull out that negative, it just changes this to plus a positive and from zero to pi over three. All right, so when we plug that in, I've got a negative one half times the cosine of two pi over three minus the cosine of zero. And then we're gonna add to that the cosine of pi over three minus the cosine of zero. Ah, my stupid alarm keeps going off, sorry. All right, so the cosine, sorry, this negative one half is coming along for the ride. The cosine of two pi over three is another negative one half. The cosine of zero is positive one. So this is negative one half minus one. And then over here, the cosine of positive, or sorry, the cosine of pi over three is a positive one half minus the cosine of zero, so minus a one there. Um, let's see, so in this first parentheses, negative one half minus one is negative three halves. So I've got negative one half times negative three halves. And then over here, one half minus one is a negative one half. I'm running out of room, going into no man's land. All right, negative one half times negative three halves is positive three fourths. And then we're subtracting from that one half, which is the same as two fourths. Three fourths minus two fourths is one fourth. All right, so all that to say the area of that entire region bound from zero to pi over three is one fourth.